Elk season is not over, y'all, not by a long shot. Late season elk hunting can be one of the best times to fill a tag and put meat in the freezer. Whether you're looking for that mature bull, a spike, or a cow. And don't be fooled, a cow or spike elk hunt can be one of the most exciting and epic hunts you've ever had. Yeah, buddy. And that's coming from guys with a lot of elk hunts under our belts. On today's show, it's all about hunting late season elk knowing what you're looking for, where to find them, how to hunt them, and tips to help you along the way. Those topics along with our Elk Bros shout outs and questions from our Elk Bros mailbox. So my friends, pull up a chair, adjust your volumes just right, and welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting, brought to you by ElkBros.com, with your host, Gilbert Ornelas, and Elk Hunting Coach, Joe Gilly. You want to hunt elk? And they live to hunt elk. Their goal is to share with you what they have learned grinding it out for over 35 seasons doing what they love. So come on into camp and set a spell. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunters. Hi. Hello there, everyone. If it's your first time with us, glad to have you. Hope you enjoy our show. And for those blue collar hunters following our show and grinding it out with us every week, welcome back to Elk Camp. I'm Gilbert Ornelas, the host of your show, coming to you from Spring, Texas, and from Katy, Texas, the one and only, the founder of the Venezuelan <laughs> Mafia, Luis Gonzalez, <laughs> and from Cimarron, New Mexico, our elk hunting coaches, uh, Joe Gillia and Leroy Chav Chavez. Good, good afternoon. Good evening, guys. How are y'all doing? What's man, Beto's so slick, good. man. He just knows how to put the founder in there, which <laughs> doesn't necessarily mean the leader, but you know, it's just like getting better, oh, man. Are, getting are better. You gonna cry all night long. You know, I'm telling you, you know, it just I'm gonna have to call for vote. You know, you, <laughs> what, what, what you're going to need to do, bro, is you just need to get you some John Lennon shades like our brother over there. Yeah, man, talking about that Jack Nicholson <laughs> look he's got yeah. going on, man. I'm going to go get my shades and join the parade, man. Say yeah, something, Chav, so everybody can see you. Let's roll bright in here. <laughs> yeah, it's so bright I got to wear shades. Yeah, oh, he, man. but he looks smooth, though, man. I mean, it just I makes know. it just, yeah, it just has it's that smooth. effect. He's got man. that flow, you know, and the collar matches the Elk Bros logo in his hat and all. Cool, and... like the other side of the pillar, babe. That's right. You, you, you know what, uh, Luis? I think if you had some glasses like that, that might legitimize that uh, whole lead title. The title, the yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, I agree. Yeah. I agree. I'm gonna have to think about something like that to get, yeah. earn some, gain some respect around. Gotta here. have some street cred, boy. Jesus, well, man. that's why he went for the facial hair just to get a little bit, yeah. you know, to, to put right. on yeah. that air of well, well, it Believe it or not, Chapo. it was the only way that I could get Joe to tell me this season is like, you finally look like an elk hunter. <laughs> and I was like, internally, I was like, yeah, I know it's the beard. Yeah, the not the baby face. No aside. shortcuts, bro. There's no shortcuts. <laughs> There's do, no not, do not let our grinders out there think that that's going to be a key, man. <laughs> 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 uh, we got something cool coming up, okay. and uh, we'll start it off with, hey, grinders. Hey, hey grinders. Hey, 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 grinders. It's Episode 94, y'all, with Epic Elk Bros event right around the corner. It's the Blue Collar Elk Hunting Podcast 100th episode. <laughs> <laughs> and we are looking for two of our grinders that want to join us, the Elk Bros, on our 100th episode of Blue Collar Elk Hunting. So if you want to join us, here's what you do. All right, first... Tell us about your journey as an elk hunter. It doesn't have to be just this year. Just your entire journey as an elk hunter. And two, why would you want to join us in our 100th episode? It doesn't matter if you did or didn't punch your tag this year. Or if your hunt is still coming up. We'll be selecting two grinders and giving gear to some of those that ride in as well. 
Yeah, there we go, man. Amen. I I, you I can't guys. wait till that hundredth episode <laughs> hits, man. I'm I'm. It's going to be cool to see all this come together. Guys, you know what time it is. It's shout time out, for the shout Elk Road out, shout, shout Out. out. Shout if you're new to our show, we usually out, shout out to a few cities with the most listeners topping our charts this week. Yep, and first up, this top listening city received its current name in 1899. Uh, Gilbert, you remember that date, right? Absolutely. <laughs> because of its Got location. <laughs> I bet you do. Because of its location at the highest point along the Illinois Central Railroad between Memphis and New Orleans. Originally named the Highland Colony, guys, you might find yourself having to do a double take in confusion if you're driving down Interstate 55 here. That's because this city has a 190-foot scale replica of the Washington Monument visible from the road. That is actually a fiberglass obelisk that houses antennas for many of the nation's popular cell phone carriers and it's right wow. here in ridgeland mississippi Eww. ridgeland mississippi <laughs> sticks of one hand what's that <laughs> that's the area code over there in mississippi 601 oh 601 i, I would yeah. not know that you lived there didn't you no my uncle did <laughs> 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 hey Mississippi man, it's so great to have you leading the charge, man. East is coming in. Sounds good. And next up, we have um this place separates the Gulf of Mexico from <clears throat> Laguna Madre. One of the few hypersaline lagoons in the world. It is the longest stretch of undeveloped barrier islands in the world. The park protects 70 miles of coastlines, dunes, prairies, and wind tidal flats teeming with life. It's 100 miles from South Padre Island on the same barrier reef. And this is Padre Island National Seashore, Texas. Texas in the house. <laughs> the Lone Star State showing out. That's right. Yeah, man. It, it, so Padre Island National Seashore is its own community separate? Yes, sir. Wow, that's so cool, man. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah, and Padre that... Island's its own little community. Wow. Yep. And, and so these guys are, they've actually got internet out there disconnected from the mainland then, right? <laughs> yes, sir. Absolutely cool, man. Hey, guys, thanks for listening. You bet. Hmm. Okay, okay, next up. Really? Idaho's third most populous city, located 20 miles west of Boise. The name may have originated from a Shoshone word meaning either moccasin or footprint. It was originally called New Jerusalem because of a strong religious focus of its early settlers. Top attractions in the area include the, the Warhawk Air Museum and the Deer Flat National Wildlife Refuge in Nam. Uh, Idaho. Nampa, Idaho. Nampa, Idaho. Nampa, Idaho. I, Man, I love to see Idaho in the house. I, yeah, I've been to Parma, <clears throat> Idaho, and Boise over there. Um, mm -hmm. Man, I tell you, with all the people and all the places that we've got from Idaho, really would like to go up there and visit some more. And it's not that far for us, really. So I think that'd be a, an awesome place to go. How many hours is it to, to Boise from? Cimarron, brother, is it 10 or 11? Gosh, man, I tell you, I was in college when we made that trip with my roommate. But, I mean, we just popped up there through the Four Corners into into Utah and then uh, across mm -hmm. Salt Lake City just right there. Um, mm -hmm. Went by the Great Salt Lake. I had never seen that before. It's cool um, to be in oh, man. Copper Mine, Great Salt Let me Salt tell you, where you go right there and how it changes from, you know, from those prairies to those extreme mountains right there behind oh, yeah. Salt Lake City. Gorgeous mm -hmm. over there. And then when we got to... Um, when we got to Idaho, you know, the farmland, the rolling hills to the incredible mountains and the Snake River going through that, another just gorgeous state over there. You know, there's so much of the West. Uh, shoot, there's so much of my own home state here in New Mexico I haven't seen, but, you know, gosh, some gorgeous, gorgeous places in the West. So, um, Idaho, thanks for listening. Joe, this city is in the southwest portion of New York, located between Lake Erie to the north and the Allegheny National Forest to the south. Nearby, Chautauqua 
lake is a freshwater lake used by fishermen. I probably butchered that name, Joe, but here they, oh, they'll, I, they'll, they'll text good. us and let I us know. I think you nailed right? it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you nailed it. <clears throat> by the freshwater lake used by fishermen, boaters, and naturalists. Once called the furniture capital of the world because of the once thriving furniture industry. It's home to the National Comedy Center as well in Jamestown, New York. Jamestown, New York. New York. Jamestown, New York. I, New York. Most likely um, named cool. after King James, I would imagine, huh? I would oh, imagine. Because we had I've never Town, been Virginia. on Chautauqua or Chatta, Chattaqua. Uh, Chatta, yeah. I wish somebody I wish somebody would tell us how to say that so we don't and, butcher it so bad. Well, we have some listeners from big. Jamestown, New York. You guys um, send us in something. Yeah. Tell us how we <clears> said <throat> that right there. And, uh, and, and I know you didn't mind us messing it up because you guys are used to comedy and we got plenty of that going on. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Last up, Luis. All right. Last one up. We got the capital of the Canadian pro, uh, province of Manitoba that is located at the intersection of the Red and Assiniboine Rivers, known as the Cultural Cradle of Canada. It's located north of the jet stream, usually a cold air mass. Add fast winds, which are prevalent in the prairie town, and the weather can get very, very cold. Ooh, I don't like that. <laughs> Home to Canada's Royal Winnipeg Ballet, the Royal Manitoba Theatre Centre, and the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra. Oh my Winnipeg, God. Manitoba, Canada. Winnipeg, oh, Manitoba, Canada. Yeah, that place sounds way too cultural for my kind. Man. Way too cold <laughs> for <laughs> mine. Cold. I guarantee you it's kind. cold as Hades up there, boy. It oh, is man. unbelievably cold they, at times. They got the ballet, the theater. Yeah. The yeah. symphony, that place is just oh, rocking cultural, with culture, Joe. man. Heck yeah. And I'm you telling bet. you what, buddy, I sure am glad that you had to say that name of that river because of the way it's spelled. I, I'd have been all over the place with I, that. Uh, I had to get some uh, some help from my friend. It's like a Santa Boney to me. <laughs> a Santa yeah. Boney. It's a so good, thing, you, good thing you didn't give it to the, to the southern boy down here. I'd have butchered it up real good. Well, well, are you saying you looked that up? Assiniboine. Did, did, did you get that? Did you get help I had on? To, no, no, I had to look it up, man. Assiniboine. Assiniboine. Uh, Assiniboine is what uh, the pronunciation thing I found. You, you killed it, man, except for that. Uh, that I awesome. trust you, everybody. If Manano was here, mine would have sounded perfect. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to blame it on Manano. As you do. Yeah, we miss Manano, Manano man. Manano. Hey, guys, you guys listen. We're going to have Manano back real soon, man. So yeah, He's feeling uh, a lot better. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. feeling yeah, he's better. He's out of the woods. Yeah. You betcha. He hasn't been feeling too good. <laughs> going to be good um, to get our brother back. <laughs> Absolutely. So, y'all, um, tonight, man. Late season elk hunting, Joe. Late season elk hunting. And there are a lot of seasons going on right now for bulls, cows, spikes. There are a ton of hunters still hitting the woods. Um, most of these people out there are rifle hunters, right? But mm -hmm. there's going to be a lot of muzzleloader hunters. And, and I even saw, and I'm trying to remember if it was Montana or or Idaho, but one of those states still had a late season archery hunt that they're doing. So, and you know, in, in New Mexico, I don't know if other states are the same way, but in New Mexico, if it's a rifle hunt, you can hunt it with a, or, you know, with a bow as well. So, you know, it's uh, because you're limiting yourself some more, mm -hmm. but we still have, we still have uh, Wyoming with late season cow elk hunts. Montana is going till November 29th. Montana, it's my <coughs> birthday right there, man. So I, I want to hear yeah. some birthday bulls happening on the 29th. Yeah. Uh, Colorado has his third rifle from the 7th to the 13th. So when this comes out, there's some of those guys that are hitting the woods that week. And we have the fourth rifle, November 18th to the 22nd. And I'm not going to jinx you guys from the 7th to the 13th because that can be really good. But I think the longer that gets, um, sometimes the better with those bulls that are getting out and feeding more. Idaho, yeah, Idaho <laughs> is the one that has archery rifle and muzzleloader hunts still. New Mexico... All of our late hunts are pretty much cow hunts, but there are some limited bull and muzzleloader, you know, limited bull muzzleloader hunts, and I believe that private land can do some of those late season hunts. But one thing I wanted to say about late season hunts and, and 
one of the reasons I think New Mexico doesn't do that, or this is kind of my thought processing on it, is that I still truly believe, y'all, I think one of the best opportunities to get a big mature bull is late season because those guys um, at that point they started to separate from their herds. Well, the big guys, the big, big bulls have already separated. Remember, they were shadowing for a little while there, right? right? Waiting for the yeah. estrus. And, and then they bail off, and they go into those holes by themselves to right. recover. So uh, yeah. they're pretty much solitary, and their whole thing at that point is just they don't want to be around. They're, they're like... They're like elk with a bad attitude. They don't want to be around nothing, nobody. Tired. They wanna, yeah, mm -hmm. they're tired. And they're Wore just out. Been, Yeah, absolutely. That rut has just <clears throat> yeah. frightened them in. And, and then when they get up, boy, it's all about slave to their belly. Boy. Absolutely. They got to get some of that feed yeah. on now. And they've lost a little weight by Ooh, now, right? 30%. Oh, yeah, they've. 30%. So I know that bulls that, that we were weighing as 700 pounds, um, at early season, when we started taking them in October, they were down to 500 pounds. So they yep. lose a lot of weight, man, on that. It's really hard on them. Mm. So they do their solitary thing, and then they get to the point where, okay, we recovered some. Now, like Gilbert said, it's food, food, food. And they're going to be in places, and they're going to start bacheloring up, and they're going to be places where you can see them out Later in the morning, earlier in the afternoon, you can see them in, 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 in the group, so they're easier to spot. I, I truly think that's the best time to get a mature bull. I really do. And, I mean, especially because it's rifle season and these guys are exposing themselves. And I think one of the reasons New Mexico does not do that late season bull hunt, except for very, very limited, is to let them get through Recover. to the next year mm -hmm. and continue those genetics that's and why, pass that's those why on. New Mexico got yeah, before the, before the winter mm -hmm. yeah making sure they recover now them. Joe uh, well not I, only not only recover though Luis but you know we're leaving them alone so that they're not being taken so that those genetics are now coming back through to the next yeah, year yeah, yeah, in yeah. the rut no, right it. yeah no it, but the question I would have it would be so at that point, the the okay, so they're skinny. They're trying to recover, mm -hmm. um, and uh, they don't want to have anything to do with anybody. Like you said, most of them will kind of be on their on on their own. Right. How vocal are they at this moment? I guess are Those they guys? not really? No, are they not really I'm, wanting to? They're not really wanting to talk. No, so obviously, they're... that's what we're talking about today. Is the strategy is different? These guys are not talking. You're not going to be. Are you going to be able to even call them in? Okay. Are they going to be able to respond? So let let's let's that's a, that's a great question. But you got to yeah. take that one at a time because you're talking about different kind of bulls here. Mm -hmm. All right. Right. So we've got people that are hunting cows. People yep. that are hunting spikes and yep. people that are hunting mature bulls, right? And, right. and when, we say, when we say mature bulls, we should say antlered bulls because in antlered bulls, you're still going to have rags and you're going to have those older matures, right? Right. So you got to break that up too because when you say our thing's talking, those old mature bulls that went and dove off solitary that are now coming out and now November, December and having to feed hard and now they're bacheloring mm -hmm. up. Those guys, yeah, they don't want to say crap, man. They're they're not mm -hmm. saying anything. But there's still a bunch of rags, especially early November, that mm -hmm. are still going to be with the herd. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to start splitting off and bacheloring up. Now, those spikes are going to stay right at home with auntie and mama and everything like that in the herd. But mm -hmm. those antlered bulls of certain sizes are going to go start bacheloring up. OK, mm -hmm. now, when you talk about are they still talking, there are still bulls in November that are with the herd that in the mornings will do some bugling. Um, mm -hmm. I've heard it into December, man. I've heard bulls in a herd bugling. But those bulls in that herd are generally not going to be real, real big bulls. I just was on a group of 300 head of elk last weekend that had multiple bulls with them. Well, none of those bulls were even 300 bulls, none of them. But there were a lot of bulls in there, okay? And there was even some of them that in the morning were bugling. 
All right, but that's just how that's going. Does that give you a better idea there? Yeah. Yeah, no, no, that's great. Yeah. So remember, at the in October, after they split off in October, by by this uh, November 1st period, and then especially as it gets later and later, these guys are now starting to feed and feed more. They're starting to get up. If we get snows that are hitting, they are really out and about because they're just uh, – Feed, feed, feeding, man. They just need that energy source just to, to survive. The water. Yeah. 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 So, um, but he, here's something that I want to throw out there before, as we get into discussion too. Things that I'm talking about right now, and a lot of these tips could end up being region specific. Because when I start talking about snow and elk having to eat, 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 because they're getting ready for winter. Well, I was just talking, uh, well, I was actually texting back and forth um, with a, a buddy in Oregon that, you know, he lives on coastal Oregon. Mm -hmm. Ain't no snow. <laughs> you know, yeah. mm -hmm. it's a it's a jungle. They get a lot of rain. Yeah. It's rain. Thick. Yeah. yeah. So these animals are not doing any kind of migrating. Um, they're, they're not being pushed into certain areas. But at the same time, no matter what, bulls have to recover. Okay? Mm -hmm. And cows, they've got to eat because they need to deliver a healthy calf. It's a little bit different in that country where they don't have winters. And I'm thinking about some of that Arizona area as well. So I, I'm, I'm really, I, I don't know enough about those regions to speak specifically other than that's going to be something that you can still, like take for Coast Oregon. You know, for those guys there, I imagine food is still going to be huge, and I imagine mm -hmm. um, any place that there's a break in a canopy is going to be great, especially for rifle hunters because mm -hmm. – those are going to go where there's feed, and, uh, and those hunters are going to need places where they can find them and where they can have shots on them. So uh, I, I think no matter what, this time of year, we've got to think, and like Gilbert always says, man, and, it, and I tell you, the more we talk about it, it's almost a common theme throughout. Food is huge because <clears throat> elk are slave to their bellies. Definitely. Just like right. we are. I mean, we've got to have it to survive. You know, we need food and water and shelter, and those bulls are no different. They, they're they needing it because they know what's coming, especially in, like you said, geographical areas where that big snow's coming. They yep. need it. They need it to sustain themselves for that winter and fight off everything else out there that's trying to kill them. Yeah, they, they've depleted that fat source so much. They've got to get those proteins. they got to get that fat built back up. Um, yeah. They just don't, if they get caught in deep snows, their energy level to go on that is only going to be so much. You know, they've got to really um, take care of themselves. Yeah, so, and then, I mean, your fecundancy rate is important on it, too, for those cows finding food. You know, they've got, yes. to, you know, they've got to have a good fat source to be able to birth those calves and, and then nurse them and stuff like that after this hard winter. So it's, uh, it's tough. Now, that brings up another point, too, is... Uh, they don't want to deplete their energy, you know, in the heavy snow. Uh, but if, you know, if you uh, do your due diligence as far as uh, checking the weather reports, uh, the day before a big storm, they're going to feed all day long because they anticipate that storm coming in. So that would be a good time to get out there. And but, after, you know, after sure the you storm, enough time too. to get out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. after before the and after. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's huge, man. After the storm, man, once they get out of that bed, they're going to start looking for where that feed is, where they can uncover it. You're going to find those tracks. It's just, it, Chav's right, it's huge uh, that time of year. But you also got to remember this, too. The difference between at this time of year, if you're cow hunting or you're um, after any bull or you're after a spike, those herds have to find a large food source. They're in those bigger areas. They're in those fields. They're in those grassy bottoms. They're out in the prairies. They're doing, they got to find those large sources. They're on agricultural uh, areas. They need the large, where the bulls, because they're in small groups, they can still feed up in the hills. They can find uh, those grasses down in the bottoms. They can find those windswept slopes up there. Um, they can feed up on the sides of ridges where they can find enough feed there for their size of group. So that's something for you to remember as well. Okay. 
It, I'm with you, Joe. You know, I've gotten to hunt and that time of year, I'm hunting a lot in the snow, but, um, you know, we, we get up top and glass and in them parks where the elk like to come out in the mornings and feed in the evenings and feed, they're usually there, especially in full moon categories, man, the midday they'll come out and feed as well. Yeah. So, I mean, there's just a lot of good times to, to intercept a big bull that's coming out there doing what he needs to do to get that fat put back on him. Right. So let's talk about the givens, the no matter what, what, what happens right. with elk. And this time of year, you know, for us guys, when we hunt the rut, elk are hard to pattern because those bulls are pushing everything around and stuff like that. But that early season before they start the rut, and now especially, they're a lot easier to pattern. They're going to be coming and going from their favorite feed and their favorite water area, especially the feed with water close by, hopefully. <laughs> they can go a long way for water, you know, in different sources, but they're going to go to that best feed. And a lot of times, you can pattern these guys coming out from their bedding very close to almost where they went in. You mm -hmm. know, they might be a few hundred yards down or something like that, but a <clears> lot <throat> of times they're going to come out where they went in if if they're not bumped by other hunters. And that's always a possibility on public lands, right? Sure. Yeah. Um, there's um, still small bulls now that are going to be hanging with the herd, like we said, but those other guys now, the big bulls that have split off, are bacheloring up. That's a good thing about the thing, too, Gilbert, is once they group up like that, they're a whole lot easier to spot now because there's oh, yeah. multiples, right? Yeah. You know, five or six, four, eight, rather than trying to look for that solitary animal out there. And <laughs> uh, as a tip, if you're glassing in the mornings and the evenings, try to be where you can have the sun at your back Behind so that you. it helps to light them up, right? Yeah, when man, a, and they do. Win they on your up. face, sun on the back. <laughs> yeah, wind in your face, sun at your back, and uh, do a lot of glassing because that's what it's going to take. And you'll see them, man, they shine like a diamond in a billy goat, but when they get that sunlight on them. <laughs> and, avoid, and, and avoid getting skylined. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Stay low. I'm trying to figure out how that diamond got lost there, but never mind. I'll move on from there. I digress. <laughs> I digress. Uh, the other thing is, y'all, is is this time of year, you got especially, man, in, in the West, you got to think about a couple of things because your strategies now can vary because of moisture and climate con conditions. Like, Chab, you said, if it snows, right? Um elk are going to be out and generally this time of year and in December uh, a lot of places this time of year we're going to get snow but have any of you guys seen what it's like right now here in New Mexico here in Cimarron up in the hills right now dude it's we had dry. we had 84 degrees yesterday Jeez. we had 77 degrees today wow. it is now November 4th and there's not a lick of snow around this place or in the hills. Y'all had dang near three feet mm. last week, huh? Yeah. Now, I, I haven't been back up to the high country, and I imagine there's still snow up there, especially in the shaded sides. You're going to find all those north sides and stuff like that. But now those southern and western slopes and stuff are, are going to start melting off, right? Yeah. Okay. That's where a lot of those animals are going to be in that high country when I get up there. So that's one thing that I'm thinking. Now that I'm going up to hunt elk this weekend, I'm going to start looking at those southern slopes. I'm going to look at the windswept areas, and I'm going to look where that sun has already started beating down. It's not going to be the north sides. North sides are still going to be soft and deep up there. So if you have snow, what did we – we can go back to our elk hunt in September. If you have snow, what are you going to do? Dude, you stay in your tent, wrap yourself <laughs> up, no, and wait until it passes, man. Get you a track, brother. I'm get telling you. <laughs> cut some tracks. Man, cut some tracks. It was some of the that was some of the funnest hunting I've done in a long time. Never done anything like that, but I'm telling you, it took me. It took us about an hour and 30, 40 minutes to run them down, but we got it done, man. And uh, yeah. if we'd have had a rifle, we'd have killed two giant bulls. Man, it's I'm a pretty cool experience, and and to and to a chaff's point, 
you gotta get moving you get warm <laughs> <laughs> no oh, doubt. yeah yeah and and we're going to talk about that a little bit down there too when we start talking about some some hints because yeah you want to get moving but a key thing if you're hunting this time of year and the temps are way down there be careful of sweat sweat can be your enemy out there once you stop man i mean yeah yeah, it can get pretty frigid. So, yeah, let's find tracks because even if the tracks are old, they're going to give you information. They're going to show you the areas that elk are moving to and from, and that's information for you. Now you have places to start glassing. You know that elk have been down in this area feeding. Most likely they're going up to a bedding area not far from there. So those are great sides of ridges and stuff that you can start glassing up there they're going to pattern themselves and the like gilbert said what's great about tracks is man you can follow them Did, yeah. so how would you help somebody out as far as these people are going okay if i'm going to follow a track how do i tell the difference between an old elk track in the snow and a new elk track grinders tuning in thank you for listening to the blue collar elk hunting podcast our goal is to share our knowledge and help you flatten that learning curve so that you too can have some of the very same incredible experiences that have given all of us here at Elk Bros a lifetime of memories. If you like what you hear or see, you can get all of this information plus so much more from our base camp elk hunting training camp, the first in a series of online courses from our Blue Collar Elk Academy. Our base camp training camp allows me to use my coaching style and share almost 40 years of elk hunting experiences successfully hunting elk on public lands as well as over 20 years guiding hunters of all ages and experience levels. This course will be like nothing you have ever experienced in concept and structure using success-based coaching techniques that will elevate your confidence and skill sets. Our camp will prepare you specifically from that final moment most in your control, those final minutes or seconds the elk is in front of you, backwards through each step and level, allowing you to see, visualize, understand, and relate every coaching point to what lies ahead, the next step, the next thought process, the next success. Because y'all, you've already been there. You know what it looks like. By tapping my 30 years of teaching and coaching experience, our camps are developed considering multiple learning modes with text, visuals, audio, as well as video. And base camp will benefit those new to elk hunting all the way to the 10 to 15 year vet. So if you are looking for that one thing to help you fill that tag this year, invest in the most important piece of equipment there is, you and your elk hunting knowledge. You can find the Blue Collar Elk Hunting Academy and the Base Camp Training Camp at elkbros.com. That's E-L-K-B-R-O-S dot com. Keep dreaming of the screaming, believing and achieving, and most of all, keep grinding. Well, it's, man, for me, it's pretty simple. You'll see, <clears throat> for me, the older tracks were already crusted in ice in them, mm -hmm. right? The ones that are brand new, man, it's like their hoofs are so hot, they burn a hole right down through the bottom of, of the ice and the snow, and it goes straight to the grass. Uh, granted, we only had about two and a half, three inches on the ground, but right. in, that, in, that, in that fresh stuff, there would actually be grass kicked behind those tracks. In the older tracks would be ice formed on the bottom of it. And uh, so you could tell that 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 uh, that w water that had melted is now freezing over. And then, man, you'd see their droppings would melt yeah. cylinder holes right through the top yeah. of the mm -hmm. snow. And then the snow would be yellow uh, where they'd be peeing. And I mean, it's right. real. And look, they urinate a lot. They're like cattle. Uh, so when in the snow, you're going to see that. And when you get the coloration, you can pretty well know that that's pretty fresh stuff. Yeah. And what I found is, and it kind of depends, there's different kinds of snow, too. You've got that fresh powder, mm -hmm. and you have that little bit of crusty snow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, especially in fresh powder, and you'll see it a little bit with the crusty, but that fresher, depending on the depth, like Gilbert was saying, I mean, when you start talking about two, three inches, is a big difference than when you're talking about eight, 10, 12 inches. But 
when yeah. you have that powdery snow, it when they're pulling that hoof out and they're moving that foot, it it almost sends like a a a, a a fresh little pile going in front that as it gets older that dissipates it kind of disappears it kind of kind of melts down into the snow and same thing with the crusty it when they push on that you'll see some of that crust that's push up that will actually eventually melt down in it just becomes like you said it becomes kind of a, a melted track it gets a little bit bigger um, mm -hmm. it uh, it doesn't have as much form as as what happens there so yeah, Joe, uh, Joe I've got a question. In that uh -huh. snow, how much snow do they need to have before they really push out of an area? Because I know they're going to come out of them out of that high country once the snow gets so deep. Yeah. Um, so, and a lot of times that snow doesn't leave up there, so they're going to get lower out of that snow line. How much snow do they need to accumulate up there before they start it moving kinda, down? It, it really down. depends on the area and if they've had areas that are protected. I mean, if you think about um, Carl's place over there, there's some of those areas that if you had blizzarding conditions, it might be really, really bad up on top. And what happens is those elk, instead of staying up there, they bail off down into uh, areas mm -hmm. where it's a little bit more protected that uh, they mm -hmm. don't have to deal with the elements and the snow doesn't get as deep or, or something like that. But to your question, though, I find that with the herds, they get pushed down more than just the bulls yeah, do. The, the bulls, yeah, yeah they'll kind of stay in some of that deeper snow as long as they can find food. They don't want to compete with the herd. So it's a you. little bit different, right, with those. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're not talking about our snows here. I imagine, God, it would have to be something like, in my mind, it would have to be something like three foot of snow, you know, to really force them to have to go down and find something, you know, uh, those herds are all automatically going to go and look for the best food anyway. But I think just to get those bulls to even move down like that, they're, once they get that deeper snow, they're going to look for areas that they don't have to expend as much energy. As That's the yeah. key. That's the key. Yeah. All right. Um, I, and for you guys that are listening that don't know the difference, if, if you are like hunting cows or hunting bulls, not only do you need to know what a fresh track looks like, but you need to know what the difference is between a bull and a cow track. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, what's that? Size? Yeah, size. Yeah, five yeah. track. I'm yeah, good. that's the main way to tell it. And I mean, the, in mud, they talk about different things as you can see, but mainly it's size, man. Uh, in fact, I just put a story on our website uh, that I show a picture of Gilbert's hand in a in a print. And oh, a, yeah. Yeah. And mm -hmm. generally, you can take three fingers, three fingers, and just fit those inside a cow elk track. But you could take your whole dog on, uh, or yeah, almost your hand and your four fingers, and put them in a bull track. It's definitely a size difference, man. Uh, but how, I so, so how about how about like spikes or smaller bulls? Can they have the size of a cow track, big cow? A a very a, a young bull will be a little bit bigger than a, a okay. cow track like a, like a spike when you're talking about but spike. i think at this time of the year it's something else that you can kind of combine with the knowledge the size of the track would be the amount of tracks too no right? doubt Joe? no doubt that singular because bigger be bulls will mainly be by themselves so you wouldn't see a bunch of other well uh, and smaller bulls will be grouped up together mm -hmm. uh and those cows will be with a bunch of other cows so uh it, a lot of times those smaller bulls could be with those bigger groups of cows too so right uh, you're going to see a different set of tracks in those big herd. Uh, spikes will look a little bit more like cows and, and stuff Makes like that. Makes sense. About the same size. But uh, your your singular tracks that are off by themselves and away from the herd and that are big, that are big as you, my hand, that's a big bull. So, that's pretty cool. It's almost like you're trying to paint your, the picture of what walk through where you're walking cool. and what you're seeing and just kind of looking at the different sign and – and see what they're doing. It reminded me of the day that uh, Joe, you and I and Manano went out there and we were following a couple of different groups and we yep. saw where they bet it and we could see how fresh it was and we were just kind of trying to peg which direction they were going and, mm -hmm. and that was pretty neat. Just trying to paint a picture of okay, awesome. how many, which direction 
what were they trying to do, what we're lo- looking for. So yeah, those tracks told a story, told us you it know did. what kind of group it was and uh, what they were doing, and it, it sure did. When you start talking about the bulls this time of year, when you're finding and and I told you guys at that time, I wasn't looking for a single track, I wasn't looking for the single bull, I was actually yeah. looking for a group of three tracks four tracks i was looking for a bachelor group together at that time is what i was looking for and so Mm -hmm. when you're finding those small groups of four sets of tracks five sets of tracks eight sets of tracks now you're generally in those areas you're talking about especially this time of year because the herd's going to be huge for cows like gilbert was saying Mm -hmm. so when you find those fours those fives those eights that's going to be bachelor bulls okay yep yep yeah yeah, th- those cows, man, it's going to be a ton of track. Again, you can go to our website. Go go to our website and check um, uh, late season tips there, and we have some pictures of some of that on there, okay? But, guys, what if there is no snow of the ground? What if it's a dry and warm year? Huh. What, what, what are you going to do? I mean, there's nothing to track. Yeah. yeah. You still need water. Well, there you go, Chev. Hmm. Bet you they're going to have to have water. Got to yeah, have water. water. Water's key. Yeah. I, and, you know, Joe, when I harken back to our hunt this year, I truly believe that's where we cut a lot of them elk from because that's where they were going. Yeah, absolutely. You I know, mean, it was they dry. They were headed to water. It was hot. Oh, yeah. And, you know, it's still food, food food and what happens in a hot dry year some of those grasses like i said i i was on a bull elk hunt two weeks ago and i was in an area where the grass should have been good and there was none there should have been water there was none the grass had already been chewed down so now those herds were forced to go down into lower areas where there was still water down there and where there was some grass growing so you know you're going to find that water source and it's going to concentrate elk man it's going to pull them together uh they're going to and especially you know you find that food source that water source that's going to be key on there and definitely just because but guys just because there's no snow doesn't mean that the elk still aren't preparing for a winter they've still got to eat they've still got to get that back and they're you know they can tell things about the upcoming winter that we can't yeah <laughs> i yeah no. it's weird all animals feel can, it, man. Mm-hmm. they feel it they know the it's coming barometric pressure or something they just kind of some they they can yeah they can feel it well like chav said if you look up and you find a weather report in the day before they're out feeding hard well they didn't they didn't go on channel seven and check out the weather man <laughs> well you don't know that maybe maybe you know something we don't man yeah we've got that crystal ball ready yeah Mm -hmm. guys so if you are let's talk about where to find them then so uh cows if you're hunting cows this time of year cows are going to be feast or famine because it's going to be big groups so it's not like the archery season where you're going to run into group after group after group it's going to be large large herds and you're going to find them in large meadows you're going to find them in parks you're going to find them in grass bottoms on the prairie Mm -hmm. agriculture areas like we said you're going to find them in private land that hasn't been overgrazed by cattle they'll go on it they'll come off of it to bed or to get water unless they have all of that on the private Mm land um and the the interesting thing is about cows is they will bed in more open areas during the day, especially snow covered hills that are that are wind swept and stuff like that. The bulls though, um, the bulls like to winter in the same areas generally year after year. So again, if you're glassing those ridges, glassing mm-hmm. the slopes, glassing the sides of mesas. Um, I got a bull one year because they they would feed in the morning. I caught them where they were feeding in the morning. They would go into the trees, and they would not bed 300 yards from where they went into the trees. Get lazy. Yeah. yeah. They yeah. do not want to expend want energy. energy. Yeah. They want to conserve yeah. energy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. All about the conserving energy. Energy calories, you know. Yep. Yeah. 
so there's two things you can do with that. You can you can continue to glass them where they bed, and if you find where they bed down after they bed down in the morning, they are there for the duration. So if you can figure out how to make a move on them, make a stock, get above them, um, mark them on your um, base map app where you think they are, and then take a look at the topo on that and try to make a move on those, okay? But I guarantee you they're putting themselves in a position where they can see what's below them. So just remember that when you're making that move. If you can come over with something in between the two of you, then get to a high point at their level where they're still looking down below or a little bit above them, you're putting yourself in a better position to be able to take that animal because you're going to have a better look at it, okay? Uh, you bet. And then be ready, you know, don't lose an opportunity, you know, for wasting time, not being ready. You know, you guys are a lot of times y'all are going to pop up on them and they're going to be right there in front of you mm -hmm. where you got to go. So it really takes some preparation, uh, you know, practicing with your shooting sticks and uh, being ready. Uh, to, That's a uh, huge tip, Gilbert. Yeah. To shoot offhand <laughs> uh, yep. and be ready, you know. Uh, yeah. For sure. Use a branch, prone off your pack. I mean, be ready to, to get after it. You were telling me you were telling me uh, you had a hunter um, sitting down and, and use uh, the knees as kind of support for his elbows and, and, and shoot for in that position. That's pretty cool. I mean, that's, you know, you, you got to practice your different stances because uh, on an elk hunt, all those are a possibility. Absolutely. And see, that's when, when Gilbert says be ready. All right. So let's let's convert this over. Let's let's segue that into how to hunt, because these are tips on on things that and that's a huge tip right there, Gilbert, because it's one of the big, big failure points that I find with guys that I have is the amount of time it takes them to get ready, get ready to get a shot, a shot. On. Yeah. And now if, if you're stalking an animal and you've gotten above them and they're better, well, psh, you got all day, man. You can work all that stuff out. But you're not going to get to play around with everything. You're going to have to slip up, get set on something, get on them, and you're going to have to take that shot. But I'm telling you, when you come out there and all of a sudden you get an animal and they're moving and they're getting ready to get in the trees where you're not going to have a shot you got to think about some things that you got to do and you got to be ready and i mean at that point let's say that animal's moving up and you want to get a broadside shot and they're getting ready to disappear that's where that call comes in you know um mm, stop it yeah you know because mm -hmm. Luis, you were asking about calling elk well that's when you do it yeah, we're not going to call elk to bring yeah, them in. You're not going to call right. them in, but you're going to get his, their attention for mm -hmm. sure. They're going to turn. It's like, who's talking? And yeah. Why are you talking? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I, I can tell you I have stopped bulls that I, I've i had a hunter, <laughs> got the hunter in place, and the bull's coming. I stopped the bull, and the hunter couldn't get the bull in the scope. Had, yeah. had the scope dialed up too, too much. Too zoomed too much, too in. Yeah. 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 Guys, when you start out, start out on four. You can pick him up and then dial him on up from there. You know, don't start out at 10 because it's going to be a lot harder, especially in that white snow. It's going to be a lot harder to pick that bull up because everything's going to look white. You dial that thing to four. I, I do it with my kids. We get in the blind uh, deer hunting. I put it on four. They find the animal, dial it up and it's a so when, when you deer rock. hunt, what is the length of the shot that you're shooting? Under deer Typically hunting? under 200. You're right. Typically under it's, 200 yards. It's under 200, right? Mm -hmm. uh, are, 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 you, are they between 100 and 200, or are they under yeah. 200? Sometimes they can be under 100, but right. uh, and that can be challenging in itself with a scoped rifle, being as yeah. close as they are, you know. Yeah. So, again, it's just much better for us to turn the turn them down to you know it's not doesn't take too long to turn it back up yep uh and or leave it on five you know there have been a lot of there have been a lot of animals killed with a four power fixed yeah, scope you know absolutely so, i mean and even even if you're close uh, to your point beto it's hard if you got several animals there it's it's so easy to get on the wrong animal too oh, yeah. when you're when you're not when you're dialing that far 
I can't tell you how many hunters I've had. You know, I've guided a lot of guys uh, deer hunting and stuff like that, and had some elk hunters too uh, that <laughs> you know, with muzzle loaders that couldn't find them. And I'm like, oh yeah. my God, he's like as big as a yeah, house. <laughs> but he's got it turned up on nine and he can't, you know, the bull's 110 yeah. yards from him. He yeah. can't find him. So as soon as I dial it back to four, oh man, yeah, got him. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, run him back up on nine. But guys that, that don't do it all the time. You know, I, that's the first thing when a guy gets in the blind with me, I say, Hey man, you know, I ain't trying to run your business, but what's your scope set on? And they're like, Oh, I got it on like 12. I'm like, mm, yeah, let's move it back to four or five. And they're like, huh? I'm like, look, you'll thank me in here in a little bit. Yeah. You know, when, when the, cause when the pressure comes and everything, you know, is, uh, move, everything's moving fast. You're going to need to be able to pick that animal. Up. Well, and, and you, you guys get excited. Mm, um, so that absolutely. makes it a little bit harder. You the other get thing is, is sometimes it never happens you, to me. I don't know what you're talking about. Who did a lackeys? Sometimes when you zoom it up, and then let's say that you've just gone up a hill, or you see that bull, and all of a sudden you get mm. those verilakis, and you get you yeah. get excited. <laughs> now you're breathing hard, and and you when you have that zoomed up there, it's hard. You feel it's jumping a little bit, and you're like, oh, mm -hmm. I can't stay on. I can't stay on. Right. Mm -hmm. Um. And I'm going to give you a little hint for that, too, because I've had veteran hunters that have been in that position. And I've always told them, look, take three relaxed breaths, one, take a deep breath, hold, and get on. Because when you're breathing, you're going up and down, and, uh, you know, it's it's moving everything a lot of times. So sometimes, I, I don't know if you guys do that when you shoot. Yeah, so I have a breathing technique that I use that they taught us in, in ERT training, emergency response training. So when you're on target, the most important thing for you to do is breathe, because the first thing that goes when you hold your breath is your oxygen level to your eyes. So mm -hmm. it's harder to focus. So we, those three big breaths are perfect, man, because you get a lot of oxygen in there. We purse our lips together and then we start pushing air out. So we're actually exhaling as we're squeezing. And it's all an internal timing thing where you're exhaling as you're squeezing the trigger and then all of a sudden the gun goes off, scares the hell out of you. Uh, so it's part of my trigger squeeze regimen. The b three big breaths, right? And then I'm... I'm pushing that air out while I'm squeezing at the same time. So I'm not holding my breath, affecting my vision. Cause that's the first thing that goes when you hold your breath mm -hmm. is your vision will get blurry. And so uh, after you've taken those three big breaths in, you're pushing it out. And as you're pushing that air out, you're squeezing and then aim small, miss small. It don't have to be perfect. If it's in that little area, boom, gun goes off, scares the hell out of you. We got a dead elk. And right. and you are squeezing like a handshake. Absolutely. You know, because yeah. I, you know, I, I tell guys, you know, if you just squeeze like a handshake instead of just thinking about that finger, right. man, it, it just, it will surprise you uh -huh. because it, it's... Best it's shot in the world. Wrong. Scares the hell out of you. Yep. You know, mm -hmm. interestingly enough, I've been looking into um, into the back tension shooting on the archery side. Right. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, you know, it's 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 a way of act you can actually do it with our, our normal releases, mm -hmm. and and you actually start pulling back slowly with your elbow pointing out, and all of a sudden you have to let it surprise you. Mm -hmm. um, supposed to help a lot with people that have target panic and stuff like that. Right. So I'm looking into it to learn, but it's just that when you said squeeze like a handshake, it's right. kind of the same uh, principle of pulling. And I was going to ask you, Beto. On arch with archery, um, did you use? Did you have? Have you ever used that technique, that breathing technique for shooting with a bow? Same, yeah. Uh, so same I'm, mm -hmm. I'm getting a big breath in. Huh? I'm drawing, and then I'm letting it out. You know. Now you know me. I don't stay on target a long time. A long time. I get, yeah. When I get yeah. it to where I want it, man, I'm cutting it loose. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Generally, I've already found where I want to shoot the animal, mm -hmm. and and truthfully, for me, guys, and this is just me talking. It's not so bad much about where my pen is, right? It's just not. It, when it gets in that general vicinity, it's going because I know that it's in the right. We, you know, you you hear this all the time: aim small, miss small, and. Um, you know, I absolutely believe, though. I believe yeah. in that. Like, yes, absolutely. It, it's part of my my makeup. So as soon as it's there and I'm squeezing, 
it's going to break because I am starting my, when I get to my, when I get to that anchor, anchor mm -hmm. I'm starting my squeeze because I've already seen where I want to shoot him and I'm already in that general vicinity, you know? Mm -hmm. So for me guys, it's more about practice, but that twerk trigger squeeze, but that trigger squeeze is the same for me when I'm archery hunting as it is for one. Cool. Yeah, yeah. That's, I was wondering about that. It's pretty neat. Yeah, and if you do any studying at all about sniper shooting or anything like that, you'll see that there's breathing is the most important thing in the world. I just want to add another factor that, that occurs when you're uh, hunting in the wintertime. You know, the groups are really big. Yeah. And uh, if you have a license for a cow, you better make sure it's a cow, not a spike. So you know, check <laughs> Good stuff, Chad. Yeah, absolutely. Because a cow looks just like a, a spike will look just like a cow unless you really focus in on what you're going to shoot. You're right. And, and and not only groups. and and oh. Jeff, to your point too, there's generally a whole bunch of them. So you yeah. better make sure that the background behind them is clear as well. Right. Because, yeah. You know, yeah. uh, otherwise point. you're explaining how you got two with one shot. You know, that's yeah. <laughs> yeah. in dove hunting. In dove hunting, it's great. And elk oh, hunting, we celebrate. Yeah. yeah, we had we had somebody <laughs> up here a couple of years ago use a, a high powered army rifle, I guess, and with shot a full like metal three jacket. Off. It was actually, yeah, yeah. Not three elk with one shot. Yeah. Oh, wow. Man. That was expensive. Well, yeah, that was an expensive shot. <laughs> well, and, and with an illegal load. I mean, you're not supposed to use full metal jackets. Yeah, not so, supposed yeah. to use any full FMJs. Yeah, no. Yeah, so. it, it's but, important, like Chav said, to make sure your background, uh, us whitetail hunters here too, when we got guys that weren't doe hunting, we're actually cow hunting or doe hunting. Mm -hmm. So easy to mistake those younger uh, little button bucks uh, yep. for a doe, a, yeah. for a big doe. We got to yeah. really do our glass work, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If that and, head is down, man, mm -hmm. wait till you can yeah. really see it good. I mean, because yeah. you might have seen it and you thought it was a cow, it put its head down, and you take that shot, and mm -hmm. while that head is down, uh, without having a real good look at that head, make mm -hmm. sure that you've checked it out really good. Chab's absolutely right because that can be a mistake too. Now, in some states, it's what they call antlerless so yeah. a six inch a six inch is considered antlerless now there's a difference between a mm -hmm. cow and an antlerless right so mm -hmm. uh that that that's a little bit different check your state check your regs on that but what we were yeah. saying before too about the opportunity and wasting time and i was talking about stopping an elk i've i've stopped an elk with a cow call up to five times i've stopped a bull because i've had yeah. different things with my shooter happen right but mm -hmm. that's the same thing if you don't have that skill set by yourself uh you don't have to have a cow call in your mouth you just yeah just like that throw a whistle mm -hmm. out they will stop but guys man if if you're going to shoot off shooting sticks, I think so much time, I think there's a lot of shots that guys use shooting sticks that they could just shoot offhand. Honest to God. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they could get mm -hmm. down a kneeling position, kind of like army kneeling, you know, yeah, one knee down up legs. on a knee and shoot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think you need to practice that offhand. If that's a hundred yard shot with these weapons, man, mm -hmm. it's like Gilbert said, put it up, put it on the spot and squeeze man because you can drop that animal uh, my favorite yeah. way to shoot a rifle in in uh in the field like if i'm elk mm. hunting and i'm shooting is prone uh yeah. it's my favorite way to shoot off my pack i yeah. can it, you know hopefully i can get above the animal and i'm shooting down off of my pack and i am rock solid like you better not wiggle your eyeball too much because i'm gonna i'm gonna send it in there you know yeah you, just, uh, you put you put that hand uh, close to your neck, like underneath oh, the man. underneath the the just, back of the gun, like yes, that. Just yes. yeah, absolutely. And, it's but it, solid. It, which is awesome if you, if you have that ability to do that yeah. because of yeah. the terrain. Yeah. But a lot yeah. of times you get that high grass, you get the brush, yeah. and so you got to be yeah. sitting. And and so whether you're going to sit with your knees down or your knees up, practice those positions and practice so that you can, when that opportunity comes, you can get in that position, you get them into the scope, you push off your safety, your fingers now on the trigger because it's not going to be on there until you're ready to kill something, you know, mm -hmm. and, and you're going to squeeze off. But it's all got to, it sounds like it taking a long time but it's only it's only parts of a second man if you if you get mm -hmm. used to doing that and look guys you don't mm -hmm. have to practice shooting with rounds you can do all of this dry firing a, a weapon yeah. 
you know uh, That's right. you can get hundreds and hundreds of reps in doing that you know in fact mm -hmm. i like that especially with kids I like it so mm -hmm. much better than doing live rounds because a lot of times they learn to get jumpy, you know, shooting those live rounds all the time. Mm -hmm. And if you get them in the rhythm of just squeezing and dry firing, squeezing and dry firing, they get that rhythm where that moment when they go to shoot that, it's going to surprise them and, and they're going to make yeah. a good shot. So that's something to yeah. think about. So when we talk about how to hunt, guys, look, I'm, we're going to talk about this part now. Um, when we're archery hunting, we talk about hurrying up and slowing down, but we're doing things where we're using our calls and stuff. Now it's a totally different thing. Covering ground is imperative, whether it's with a vehicle. So it's going to be vehicle first, whether I don't care what that is. If it's UTV, ATV, if you're in a truck, you want to get to different areas that you're going to go to. If you can cover areas where in a vehicle where you can look into places to find tracks, to cut track, you know, to locate things like that, to locate animals to look off into places then then you want to try to do that to cover as much ground as it's all possible. about gathering as much information as absolutely possible. man yeah. absolutely and and yeah. it's so it's and then if you can do that and at the same time do glassing yep then you cover even more ground absolutely or if you're going to use a vehicle to get into glassing points where you're going to hike a little ways to glass off it's all about covering ground, whether with your eyes, whether with a vehicle. Your feet is last, man. Your your feet uh, covering mm -hmm. ground. I mean, there's some people that if you're in an area that you know there's going to be elk and you're going to hike into a certain location because you know that there's elk in there, they're always in here. You're guaranteed to find something. You're at a point where you can look into three different basins. Then that's great. You have that knowledge factor. But if you're going in blank, and you don't have that knowledge factor, you've got to be able to cover ground either with the vehicle first, with your glasses second, and with your feet last, man, because you need to get, like Luis said, information. Now, once you've located where those animals are, that's a different ball game. Uh, on that one bull hunt two weeks ago, it took me three days to locate where they were at. Once we did and we figured out their pattern of moving, then we hiked into the area and we were ready for them to go in Man, they went in probably a hundred yards from where they came out, and we were waiting for them. Right. So, uh, when you when you talk about quality optics for glassing, Joe, mm -hmm. is it, is there a way to kind of patent the glasses that Chav is using right now? Because I really <laughs> want some optics like that when I go hunting, man. I mean, you all got to check this out, man. Chav is just stylish, man. I just cool you know, what's all that? <laughs> you you know. Uh, I, I find a lot of slice.com. <laughs> I find a lot of animals with my eyes when I'm doing things, but when I'm guiding guys, man, uh, my optics are critical. Not only, I mean, to make sure yeah. again that if they're cow hunting, that it's not a spike or something like that. But the other thing that is critical to me is I have, I, I've got the um, furies where. Uh, my rangefinder is built into my uh, optics. Yeah, I've got one of those too. They're pretty cool. Well, and it saves you time. You're not. Mm -hmm. You're not. Yeah, you're not switching optics yeah. from one to the other. Yeah, yeah. I can study an animal, and if I, you know, let's say that we're on a management hunt, we're on a management bull hunt, mm -hmm. or you guys are hunting um, uh, an antler bull that has to have uh, four has to have four tines on it or has to have one tine over six inches, right? Now it's critical to be able to study and get that distance if it's if it's outside, like if it's at 200, 300 range and that's critical for you in just in your comfort zone, you need to know that. If it's under 200 yeah. and you're sighted or if it's under, if it's a 100-yard shot, you're not worrying about this, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to check mm -hmm. with your optics and you're going to pop that animal or you're going to actually even more, you're going to look through your scope and see it, yeah. study it and pop that animal right so uh but quality optics man you're going to do so much glassing it, it can wear on on your eyes and when i say quality it doesn't mean you have to spend three thousand five thousand bucks man no. there's some great glass out there there really is from nikon to vortex, vortex to i mean yeah. you know Bushnell. It's very bush very very yeah. affordable and yeah. uh you don't have to break the, you don't have to go get a pair of swarovskis or Zeiss or you know Leicas. I mean, it, those are very high end. And they, look, they're awesome. But there, there's other 
other very good glass. I've, I've been using some Vortex and Leopold that both I like a lot. You yeah. Know. And, you know, once you've done your glassing, you're generally going to make a move on that animal if you've located the animal. So that means that you're going to stalk in on it. And um, I've been caught in situations where I've been stalking in on a herd or on multiple animals. And when I'm stalking, uh, I'm trying to get to an area where my hunter or myself is in a comfortable shooting range right so one of the things there's some things that i tell people when you're stalking if you're coming to a rise if you've gotten a rise in between you and an animal and you're trying to get up to that animal do not go up and start walking to that rise get down as low as you can keep your head below that rise and periscope up real slightly mm -hmm. just so you can put your eyes just barely above it is nice and slow instead of walking to it so that your body creates an action and they see that coming up there and another thing is is and we've done this guys stalking archery you know um mm -hmm. we, we we've done it with multiple people we've done it with four people together right sure um, have. <laughs> is that it's best for you to move when they are moving yeah. Yep. yeah, because everything's moving in their world. Yeah. Yes, you know? absolutely. And they don't pick up your movement as movement that's uh, obscure or um, that alarming, right? Everything's moving around them. And it's best for you to be in shadows if possible um, when you do yeah. that. You know something else that you just reminded me? When glassing, when you're glassing an area... It's kind of like the same thing with what we just talked about an elk. It's better to keep your glasses still on an area and look in that area with your eyes rather than yeah. keeping your, your yeah. eyes. Yeah, if you keep moving glasses. your, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. an excellent point because if you keep moving your, your optics, then you're going to miss out on small movement. But if you keep them steady, then you pick up on any small movement and those, those could be animals. So that's an excellent point. An ear yeah. flicker, just the yeah. glint of a... Yeah. yeah. You want to put Good those stuff. glasses there and you look through all areas of the glasses and then move your glasses and then check all those areas of the glasses. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I'd recommend you guys getting a, a good your use your shooting sticks to set your glasses up on, man, and it really it solidifies them when you ain't got a lot of shake and everything, and it just helps you so much more when you're glassing. It also helps when you have contact, good contact with your binos and your forehead. If you can just keep your forehead and your hand touching your forehead and your binos and also helps with the range finder too when i put the range finder and my hand is actually kind of touching my forehead and and my uh my cheek more stable it's it's way more stable that way that if i'm just trying to kind of hold my um my range finder floating in front of my eye then obviously way harder to do i i a buddy of mine chad Riker from backcountry rookies podcast has a neat little setup with a very light tripod that he takes and an adapter for his binos. So he puts his binos oh. on the area and he looks through his binos without moving his binos at all. And uh, yeah, I like cool. it so much better than a spotting scope because I have a hard time with that whole one eye thing. Yeah, me Just, too. Yeah, man. I don't yeah. like it. A lot of guys use them, and when especially when they're, you know, been on some of these bull hunts that we're shooting inches you know when you know gotta know so it's really important to be able to see if it's that 25 inch four or five you know what i mean so they break out that big thing they can see them for four miles away but man it is hard to get one and eye then your there. left eye gets blurry oh man it's right else. When, yeah it's blurry just, after when you try to open it up and it's like man it's blurry on one side and kind of neat on the other and it's pretty cool to... when you're looking at them from miles away though well, and, the, and the thing is, yeah, you're right, and you can get some pretty neat video and stuff like that yeah. off of them, but now they're making those same adapters for binos. Yeah. But if you're going to carry binos with you anyway, um, to me it's better just to make them an all-around instead of carrying binos and a spotting scope, you know. Uh -huh. Hey, Chab, I was going to ask you, uh, you know, because I know a lot of rifle hunters, and we've been around people that um, they don't even <laughs> – the wind and thermals aren't a thought. Is that something that you think they can ignore? 
the wind and the thermals? Yeah. Um, not really. You know, it, I think it's still the same effect, uh, you know, any time during the year. But I, I think if you're pretty far away, uh, it, it won't affect as much. And that depends which way the thermals are going. If it's a crosswind or right. a direct wind to your face or be, or behind your back. Sure. Uh, I would think there's a there's still a factor involved there. Absolutely. I, I think that's one of the big mistakes sometimes. Because, Luis, you, did, you, you mentioned on the last podcast the distance mm. in which um, certain animals can pick up scents. Yeah, scent carries, yeah. Yeah. yeah somebody so, mentioned yeah. It last week. What, yeah, it was uh, a pig was like so it, much. And a, a, yeah. pi a pig was like uh, a mile. The best, mile. weren't they? Or bear was, huh? <laughs> Yeah, bear was the best. Then pigs, then elk and a whitetail, mm -hmm. and then coyotes. And how how far could a could an elk pick up a scent? Uh, about the same as the whitetail, and I think it was uh, half a mile, maybe. Half mile, right? Yeah. Uh, I may have to. I you know, let me get back with you on that one. Let me I, I'll I look it up. I believe you that's right, man. And so yeah. I think that's a big mistake. So when you're hunting, make sure you're paying attention to the wind for a lot of reasons. You might get up on top of a place. And you, you don't want to blow an animal out if the wind's at your back going down there, especially if it's an early morning and thermals are falling. Because if you have the wind at your back and thermals are falling, you're just putting set, scent right down into that canyon. So that's something for you to think about is that as well. Um, I, I think a big one for you guys, a tip, is knowing how to finish. And you, we wouldn't think um, that this is something to mention, but you would be surprised how many people are not sure where to shoot an elk uh, to put one down fast. Now, we mentioned that in our last podcast. And again, you can go on our site and look at our, uh, on our website. You can go there and look at our shot placement. Um, we have it on video if you want to do that. I had a hunter this last week, I just did a story on that, was very nervous about where to place a shot on an elk. Watched our, um, our video on shot placement. The next morning, he hearts a cow at 126 wow. yards, and I mean hearts the cow, just like a pro. So um, wow. that, that can help you out with that. And the other thing I would tell you is on knowing how to finish. Again, when you take that first shot, you are not done. Reload. You're, you're, Right. You're listening, you're watching how that animal reacts, and as soon as you shoot, you're racking another shell. If that animal starts to go off, you want to put another one in, put that animal down. If you shoot a second shot, you rack a third one on there, you know, and you want to, especially with the rifle, put that animal down because you, you know, you don't want that animal running off and not find a blood trail. So, exactly. You know. My I, I hunt Neil guy down here in South Texas, and they'll tell you if he's got his head up, he's gonna get up. And I'm, I've seen it time and time again, guys shoot him, knock him down, everybody's high fiving, and he's got his head up, and then whoosh, here he comes up, right? So I'm of the same opinion. If I can still see him and he's got his head up, I'm putting another one in him until either I can't see him anymore or he's done moving. You know, um, no doubt, Joe, got to be ready for that. Uh, don't celebrate it ain't over yet till he hits the ground and can't get up, you know. Yep. Uh, I, I, man, one time I'm going to tell off on my good Canadian buddy Steve Tucker here. Um, Tucker, we love you, man. Uh, one time Tucker got up. A, a, I don't know what happened, but maybe it was a premature pulling of the trigger, but we had a big, giant 330-inch bull in front of us, about 134 yards and, and with a muzzle loader. And he shoots this bull and knocks him clean off his feet, and, I mean, just crashes, just, I mean, crushes this bull, dude. Down goes Frazier, and, I mean, he's down <laughs> – on the canvas boy doing the old kick dance and everything. Well, we just start high-fiving and I piled up on him and everything. You know how we do. And uh, I'm telling you what, son, that bull got up and ran up the hill about 35 yards. And I, I happened to have my diaphragm in my mouth and I called and stopped him. And luckily we got to reload that, that uh, muzzle loader and <laughs> yeah. I, he got another muzzleloader in his hand and laid back down. Boom! He shot three foot over his back this time. Oh, my uh, god! And I'm like, what in the world is going on? So we get down there, and, uh, you know, it's almost dark, and it's me and 
the famed R.C. Knox, uh, <laughs> one of the best elk hunting guides in all of New Mexico. We got to give R.C. a good shout out. Uh, R.C. and I were with him, and we walked down there to the spot where that bull was, and there is not a speck of bud anywhere. I'm talking nowhere, Joe. And what I'm shining my light and everything else, and all of a sudden I see this long antler about that long, okay, with a big front curl on it. He shot that bull in the front curl of that oh, horn, and it knocked hit that him in bull the horn. off. Hit him <laughs> in the horn and knocked him down. It hit him so hard. It's a fifty caliber Barnes oh, yeah. bullet. Oh, and yeah. I turned and I looked and I seen something shiny on the ground. It was the Barnes projectile puddle, puddle, with all its pedals pulled out, laying there right next to the horn, Joe. Uh, me too. I mean, craziest thing I've ever seen. And that bull, no worse than a while, just just shot his horn off, but. Uh, we thought we he'd made a killing knockdown shot, hit him right in the middle of the shoulder, because that's right where I told him to aim, right behind, right in the middle of the shoulder. And oh no, he just hit him in the horn. I hope he turned. <laughs> Craziest thing I ever seen. It, like I said, and then uh, the third shot, I think he was just so shook up that the bull got up that he shot three uh, foot over his back. <laughs> that's cool. Old Tucker, hey, man. Tucker's oh, had some Tucker. bulls now, ain't it, Joe? Yeah, like, am I uh, lying, Joe? Tucker's been on some bulls now. Tech Tucker, that first hunt with Tucker and Luis was unbelievable, man. I mean, I, I think they got spoiled on that hunt. They were like, oh, this is easy. Yeah, bulls <laughs> everywhere. Bulls, bulls everywhere. We, bull we, fest New Mexico. That's I don't where think we, we saw a cow, man. It was crazy. Until yeah, it was tons, yeah. tons of animals, tons of encounters for sure. Uh, says, absolutely. Hey, Gilbert, hey, uh, man. Coyote, quarter mile, white tail and elk, up to half a mile wild hogs up to five miles and wow. then black bears up to 20 miles wow that's crazy now unbelievable El Oso's got it going on brother so you guys out there man we're excited for you 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 late season hunters it's a great time it's a great time to hunt it's a great time to put uh uh, animals on the ground where you don't have to worry most of the time. Hopefully you get some cooler weather than we have yeah. out here. Uh, it really helps with that. I, I will give you a, one tip, though, uh, this this time of year is it sure helps if you use rubber gloves in your kill kit. And uh, sometimes if you uh, if you will do a, a double on that just to kind of give your hand. Once you get inside the carcass, not bad, but I tell you, when you when you start to come out and all that blood's on your hands, it can it can make that hand pretty cold. Uh, but the nice thing is you can get it off without having to wash with hand, you know, wash with water and stuff, and that helps in freezing conditions. So that's one tip there. So Gilbert, why don't you take us to our Elk Bros mailbox, man? Sounds good. Well, uh, we're gonna go down to uh, Drew uh sayer i guess how you yeah, pronounce drew. that yeah drew we sayer left drew hanging last week huh we did man he's got a whole bunch of stuff that uh drew's from birmingham alabama and guys we would like it when y'all put you where you're from then we can yep. announce you know give you a little shout out to your hometown they're out of birmingham alabama the crimson tide folks are doing well and uh Drew, we're going to read your question here and see if we can't get you some answers. There you uh, go. First off, he says, staying in the areas we've hunted. Well, let's see, right on the top says he's working out something there. See that? Right oh, gotcha. There? Yeah, he says, yeah. we're working through some pros and uh, and cons of, okay? First so he all. says, staying in, the, yeah, first of all, staying in areas we've hunted, familiar but uh, low elk numbers, he said, versus moving to a new area with high elk numbers. Uh, keeping in mind that I don't live in Colorado anymore, so I'd like to have to go in blind, really. Uh, he says, I might uh, be able to sneak in a quick summer scouting tri trip, but maybe at the expense of days in September. Hmm. My sense is I'd rather scout with a weapon versus scout without one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and he I'm says, two. Of, yeah, well, let's, let's come over number one before we move to that, okay, that cool. second one there. And, Sounds good. Uh, I don't know. What do you guys think? He says he's he says they're thinking the pros and cons of staying in the area they've hunted that they yep. know, but there's low elk numbers versus moving to that new area, and and you guys heard the rest of it there. So what what do y'all think? I, I try something new. Mm -hmm. I mean, I you know that you may you may find that new area if you think there's more elk numbers. I mean, you you're trying to increase your opportunities, right? So. 
yeah, you, you may have to do a lot of learning early on, but then, you know, once you get familiar with the area and understand their feeding, uh, their water sources, um, you may be in higher cutting than you were in your old area. You may end up finding out this place is way better than the one you used to hunt. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with that. And, and, and Drew, if you use base maps or Onyx to do a lot of your virtual scouting, man, e e -scouting. I think you can re yeah, e scouting. I think you can really uh, do what you're talking about in a scout with a weapon versus scouting without one. So, uh, you know, I, I think that's the way I'd go. I don't know about yeah, you. Yeah, that way you won't go in so blind. Yeah. What, what about you, Joe? What would you do, Chow? Well, I think if. Uh, if they do know the number of elk as far as uh, you know a high concentration or a low concentration i'd probably go with a high concentration uh because they're there for sure uh whereas the first one could be feast or famine you know so uh, i'd go where the elk are because if the cows are there the bulls are going to be there too yeah I, me i when i look at that and i and i see somebody's familiar um with an area that to me is, is a huge plus and so the first thing i would say is how many encounters are you having yeah. a day when you hunt that area how I mean, successful have you been in that area yeah i mean if you're having multiple encounters a day because you know it even though there's low elk numbers sometimes low elk numbers sometimes equals low hunters and if you know it and you're having a multiple encounters then then i'm you know for me that's a little bit tough one because then you're leaving elk to go find elk there. So it, it just kind of depends on, uh, I would gauge it that way. Now, if you're not having a lot of encounters and you're bumping into yes. a lot of hunters, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. Try yeah. something else. Yeah. And yeah. that's the way I read it because when he says familiar but low elk low numbers, numbers, when he, he says low elk numbers. numbers, to me, he's telling me he's not haven't had many. much encounters well okay. when i see low elk numbers I, I it looks like he's looking at total herd size from one place to the other it could and, be oh, uh, on data that he's looking yeah, at yeah. yeah oh i got you to me I that's what i see because he's comparing one area to a, another right gotcha. so mm -hmm. that that's the only what i see there now if i do go to the new area and i had that choice of um going in early in the summer versus september dude it's september all the way yeah absolutely yeah that's with a gun in your hand yeah <laughs> that summer scouting trip you can go in and you can They'll get to know the area um yeah you're you're, you're learning topography not elk behavior or exactly. anything like that yeah and and now i'm not going to knock knowing topography because when sometimes when you can relate what you're seeing with your boots on the ground with what you're seeing on base map that helps a ton but i'm with you dude i mean we like to hunt scout if i if that meant me being there and having more days in september where the elk are where they're going to be rather mm -hmm. than in summer where the elk are and where they're yeah. not going to be in september i'm mm -hmm. definitely going with, with getting september. fresh info yeah. Plus, I mean, even topography, you know, vegetation and stuff that it changes a little bit from the summer up until you get to hunt. So well, even you're right. then things may look different. Amount of water yeah. changes, the type of grass changes, you know, those types of things. So, you know, when uh, I was fishing professionally, <clears throat> I would I would practice when I first started, man, I would practice in the areas that I was going to fish during the tournament. And man, I'd beat those fish up. And when I'd go back to them, they didn't want to bite very good because of the pressure that was on them. So what I'm trying to say is when I changed my practice, or how I practiced or how I pre-fished, I would go to new areas that I've never been before and I would just go look. Uh, I wouldn't fish. I would go look at the area and see what the bait looked like, see what the creek channels of grass, the cover, stuff like that. And then if I did fish and I found something, well, I would, you know, use that as a backup plan to come back to. And a lot of times my plan A wasn't, wasn't working. So plan B was, man, plan B, glad I found it, right? So that's how I got to learn areas was just like he's talking about, go in there, do some scouting, learn the, learn the area of the land, and then, uh, come go time, come game time, I was in there, you know, uh, with boots on the ground and, and figuring it all out. So right. but, I, but, I think that helps a lot. But for me, sacrificing actual hunting days to do that, no, no, I, yeah, I, yeah I, I don't know that I would do that. And if mm -hmm. I had I'd rather extra, have a rifle in my hand. 
Yeah, if I had extra days in there, and uh, man, then I tell you what, I would be covering as much ground as possible the first couple of days yeah. and really taking a look at things. So what's the second part? Second, second, part? second part, he says OTC archery, uh, over-the-counter archery versus mm -hmm. first rifle. Limited entry, but only looking at areas that are not likely to require points. <laughs> says, oh, for man. example, we could almost certainly get first rifle tags in some areas which have pretty high success rates. I, I what do you guys think? I, well, for, for, for several things go here, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a tough question. And one is like, okay, how important is it to fill the freezer? Mm -hmm. You know, if, if, if that's the first question to me, if, if well, why if, do you say that, dude, why do you say that? Well, because if it's high priority to fill the freezer, then you would go with the, with the first rifle tags because you have higher success rates in those areas that he can get. He can almost certainly get that first rifle season with a high success. Hmm. And then, you know, I, I'm not saying that it's less challenging with the rifle. No, no, I'm not talking challenging. I just, I just question the whole success rate thing because, you know, I, I, I know a lot well, of, I think if you, I think if you do look at the numbers, rifle hunters are more successful at harvesting elk than than uh archery hunters. Bow hunters i think and i think that number skewed because there's so many more so much more of them no doubt but i think the numbers would suggest that rifle hunters probably are more successful maybe because there's more of them i don't know but at the end of the day when you're looking at the numbers i would think they would suggest that so i, I see where luis is coming okay i'm an archery hunter I do. So, you know, my, my so problem me, is I get offended, my, my, dude. I'm at, I'm at 98% <laughs> yeah, Not everybody's as good as yeah. us, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing is, like, I, you know, to your point, Beto, right? I mean, if, mm -hmm. if we get an option, if you ask me, do you rather rifle hunt elk or bow hunt elk? Mm -hmm. I'm going to go bow hunting elk any oh, day, man. anytime. I mean, I've, the experience. I've done, yeah, I've done oh, it. Man. I've done it. I've done it both ways, right? Yeah. And And I just can't. To me, there's no comparison in how it feels to to hunt. Um, elk. And, and if it's an OTC, then great because you go in with, you know, you you can you have your tag already. But yeah, I get yeah. the point of being potentially busy and a lot a lot of hunters out there. But then again, uh -huh. everything we talk about is how to maximize your opportunities. Even even that being the case. So I, I'm going to give him a hybrid answer. Um, yeah. Go put in for limited entry archery um, for a better area um, and uh, that only takes one or two points or not requiring a point and there's some of those out there as well and if you don't then you can go OTC archery mm -hmm. if you want to do that you could also I'm not sure how I, I believe you can put in there as well you could put in for a limited entry archery um, in New Mexico, we do choices. I'm not sure how it is in Colorado. So uh, they might not have choices, first choice archery, second choice rifle or something like that. I'm not sure mm -hmm. how that works. I've never put in for Colorado. Uh, but me, bud, I, I, I tell you it's about what kind of experience you want. And like Luis said, how important is it for you to put that meat in the freezer? So, um, Amen. Yeah. His third part, it says, if archery before versus after muzzle loader. Uh, as we already discussed before, uh, has the likely benefit of less pressured elk. Mm -hmm. And I know that early season can be good even if elk are possibly less vocal. Uh, after muzzle loader will be right around the equinox, which is obviously the sexy time to hunt. But I'm thinking everyone else is thinking the same thing, i.e. maybe more pressure, that ain't gonna matter. And the elk will have been hunted for the past three re weeks by archers and muzzleloaders. I yeah. mean, I, I, I really like the way he structures the questions because I, I think he's got really good points. And, and uh, you know, it makes you think, yeah, absolutely. You got pros and cons, like he's <clears throat> saying at the beginning. I got um, something for him, Luis. You ready? Yeah, go for it, you bro. Ready? Don't worry about the mule going blind, son. Just load the wagon. <laughs> go hunt, man. That time of the year is the bomb, son. Yeah. Just go hunt, man. Yeah. <laughs> I, one thing also to keep in mind is that uh, um, maybe after the muzzle loader, you know, if you're going for a big bull, 
you, you may have to be mindful. That's going to be tougher as well, just because the way he's kind of protected around cows. Is that correct, Joe? Yeah, it's I mean, a little more difficult, a little more challenging. He, a bit more challenging at that front. And we show you where he's at. And all I've, all I've seen and all I've done is hunting with you guys, uh, you know, early season. And I've seen how they can be vocal and how many opportunities there have been. Yeah. And again, I do have a big advantage and I'm hunting with you guys. But uh, it's the point is that it's very doable and you can still uh, get you a, a big bull if that's what you're after. Yeah, I'm, I, I, and I think he's after any bull when I read before. Right. He said uh, he said it'll take any elk. So, Joe, in Colorado, can you hunt with an arch? Can you hunt with archery equipment during muzzleloader season? Yes. Man, yes. dude, I'd I'd have my bow with me, son, and then my buddy that's calling for me or whatever, he'd have the smoke pole with him. <laughs> you know, if that's allowed. Uh, I don't know if that's allowed, but I mean, gosh, dog. No, you man. you have to have a muzzleloader license to use a muzzleloader, but uh, gotcha. and another thing I'm going to tell you too is that muzzleloader those hunts are limited in Colorado to certain areas, so they're not in every area with that. So I would check that out as well. But I'm early season. And, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, I, I hate that muzzleloader in the middle of archery. I think that needs to be moved, <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. But, it's, uh, it's you know, amazing. the whole, the whole thing about vocality is it's a, like Gilbert said, man, just go hunt because that's a stab in the dark. There's so many mm -hmm. things that can affect that this year, guys, you know, thought they were in the prime time and elk were quiet and, uh, mm -hmm. or they were just, it was so hot, they were bugling early and in the trees. And so they just weren't hearing them, even though they were bugling. So, I mean, that, that's, you know, you can say it's going to happen and you're right. I mean, it should be more, um, vocal around there, but I tell you, I, that early season, we have killed a lot of elk. So I'm, Absolutely. I'm early on that. If, uh, if archery. Okay. I agree. I agree. Mm -hmm. And then look, if you go, if you can't get in on the archery, de ar archery deal early and you can get in, in that muzzleloader season during the equinox, Oh man, you're going to have an awesome time, buddy. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's, it's amazing. I mean, it's, they'll keep you up all night bugling. It's crazy how, how sexy that is, man. Uh, that, but that oh. muzzleloader hunt is like, yeah, it's right there around the equinox. But I, I tell you, I, I, gosh, I, I like, the way New Mexico does it, where mm -hmm. there's a break after the archery, and it mm -hmm. really lets those guys get going, and then you're back in the woods like October 6th when they're really going nuts. So, And I, I think it's so much better that way. Put in for New Mexico. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, he's got a little B section here, Joe. He says, as mentioned before, we'll take any elk. Hunting peak rut seems like a good time to pull in a satellite bull with some lost cow and regathering uh -huh. ewes. And uh, we can find larger groups of elk for sure. I'm just not sure if strategy plays well where I've, where we've hunted, yeah, in the I... areas we've hunted. You know, he says uh, there are low overall numbers with pretty high bull to cow ratios uh, on that data that he's been looking at, which was a 2019 data, mm -hmm. though the note, uh this may be artificially high he says 41 uh, to 100 is uh, that's a heck of a ratio almost two to one almost two to one mm -hmm. he said in my experience bulls are usually only keeping a group of three to six cows maybe due to the high overall number of bulls and uh, relatively and the young, young age, age class yeah. yeah the young age class yeah due to the large number of hunters he said i'm wondering if the area with many more elk with lower ratio would be better for this strategy trad uh this strategy to play out uh you know again kind of depends on the age class you know there's there's a lot mm -hmm. of variables there with that because i mean if you have low numbers with uh with uh, a low a low age class in that too those cows are just going to kind of settle in there and uh you don't have as many so there's going to be bigger groups with the cows and there's not enough competition yeah mm -hmm. i don't know about that I, I i'd really have to chew on that a little bit i I, I think um, the higher the cow ratio, uh, if your age class is the same, I, I like the competition. At least you you have bulls that are going to try to go fight and take bulls from other bulls. There's, you know, 
it's it's going to be better. And the the thing I like about it, if you go to that high um, bull to cow ratio, and you go in, and and they have a lower age class bull with those cows, now you have the ability to go in there and scream like a huge mature bull and throw <laughs> challenges out and pull those cows away, bringing that younger bull over to you, because those cows are stuck with the choice, man. They're kind of like they're the only kids in the school, man. It's they, it's mm. a small school system. They don't have many choices. But you get out there, and all of a sudden, you have a big boy out there that sounds real mature and real aggressive. Those cows will pull off. So I think I like the higher ratio the better, no matter what. There. Yeah. So now, uh, I'll have to give it out. Give it to Mr. Sawyer. Um, I think the questions are great, and I'm always, you know, happy to see guys really doing their research and thinking their hunt out and planning it right and, and just doing their homework. So um, Absolutely. Yeah, very, very cool stuff, man. Thank great you for question. writing. Yeah. So our, our last question for tonight, man, before we get out of here, is from Jason Turner from Florida. And, and Jason says, guys, I love the show and have been a faithful <laughs> listener thanks to the whole crew. He says, I have two questions. <laughs> first, and we'll handle this one first, I often hear y'all ribbing each other and having fun. <laughs> just, just wondering if there are some bloopers during the show that we don't get to hear. If Man. they only knew. And he and he said that today, and he today was today. probably the biggest day <laughs> where the biggest bloopers took place. I mean, we were, we wrote, we uh, wore the two button out. Boop, boop. I mean, <laughs> it, it was bad. It was bad. I mean, it all. It'd be like, beep, 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 beep. Yeah, it was I, pretty rough, man. And Chaff in the background was like, well, take 200. Yeah, well, take 250. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, it was bad today. I'm trying to look because I actually had a, a blooper from from last week, and oh. uh, uh, I think it was yeah I think it was last week and uh, and I I'm gonna sh I'm gonna share my screen so if any of you guys I I don't know how well it's going uh -oh. to play uh oh and I don't know if you guys can hear them. Hey, Joe you all need to understand Joe does all this stuff in the background without us knowing this is like we have yeah. not seen what he's about to play now <laughs> so, got I mean, no this, clue what he's gonna anything do anything can man. happen so uh, I'm so you guys got to tell me if you if you hear audio on this if not I'm gonna. Oh uh, boy! <laughs> I gotta find a way to do this. <laughs> so I'm gonna share my screen. Let's Thanks, see. Jason. And uh, oh, here we oh, go. Here oh, we go. big big O is in the screen on the screen. Big O is dialed up, boy. Hey, look! If you're not, yeah, obviously, in order no. to be able to see this, you no. guys need to oh, only go to the gosh, YouTube channel. Yeah, because you brought it. Here it comes. So I'm I'm more <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> Let, I, I'm wondering if you guys, if you if you hear it though, because got to, if not, I'm gonna have to put it on uh, the next time we get on here for the. But let me see if you hear it. No. Thank no? God we can't. <laughs> no, you Far didn't hear out. it. Barely hear it. Oh, Sounds barely. like very faint. Very uh, faint, Joe. Let's so see. If you let's... can't, if a tree falls in the hold, woods, does it make a on. noise? Hold on, we're, we're gonna try some here. <laughs> Hug your babies, oh, Lord. kiss your broadheads. <laughs> <laughs> there it was. Y'all saw it right here. Well, we're going to have to start that from the beginning here. Here you go. Down here in yeah. Texas, we like to close with this. You know, husbands, hug your wives. Wives, kiss your husbands. Hug your babies, kiss your broadheads. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I I get you guys hey, it's there. an age thing that is really affecting us all. The only one that is actually keeping his school year job. But yeah, uh, yeah. Don't I, kiss your broadheads, guys. You there you go, fun. Jason. Please do not do, do this at home. I do y'all get a kick out of that. Y'all ready? Here we go. Dude. I'm like, please don't do this at home, guys. Don't kiss your broadheads. That you know, may get you cut. You know, maybe with like broken lips and stuff like that. Jason, if I told you we had a blast doing this, it'd be an understatement man i mean these guys are our brothers yes do we rip <laughs> each other unmercifully man uh, you know, when manano's here it is like mutt and jeff and uh you know they are going at it like crazy so absolutely we uh we give joe all he wants on the editing side i promise you <laughs> and, and today today, man, today we oh were all God. on our tears and we yeah. were all crying i was wiping we my tears off my my face <laughs> and uh trying to kind of keep my cool and yeah. trying to read because i couldn't even read straight and uh yeah 
Yeah. So and and we don't, we really don't edit very much, but uh, <laughs> when we're trying to do an intro, <laughs> it, it, Listen, and, take time. And it just extends <laughs> it out for you guys. Yeah, yeah. You don't need to be here that all the time. So no. But, and, and I, yeah. And you're right. I mean, we barely, there's not much editing, um, like no, major no, editing, that? but no. uh, we're going to give Joe a lot of work today. Today is yeah. going to be <laughs> bad for Joe. He's going he's gonna to earn his keep today. Oh, the gear. Yeah. Well, I think yeah. that's right. So, Chad, uh, there's a second part to this. Chad, what's up? What's up? There's the a second part, part to, the to Jason's, yeah, that's, Jason's uh, uh, question. Well, I know you guys use the. Uh, uh, yeah, he says, <laughs> second, he says, I'm, base camp he says second, guys, the, I'm uh, curious about uh, the gear you uh, hunt uh, with. What's it called? He said, I, yeah, on, he said, on, I'd on love to see yeah, a gear the, dump. He said, but until then, no, no, what no, gear the, did you guys use that you can't live without? Oh, yeah. 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 So yeah. yeah. Onyx. No, no, no. Yeah. So all right, so let's let's start this from the beginning. Here. Wait, wait. Let's let's start this from the beginning. <laughs> so Chav uh, so Gilbert More do that bloopers. Again. Gilbert, do that again. Get get Chav going. Okay. Hey, so Chav, uh, there's a second part of this question right here. He says, uh, I'm curious about the gear you guys hunt with. He says, I'd love to see a gear dump, but until then, what gear did you guys use this year that y'all won't be without next year? Well, I know the Zolio was big for yeah. communication. Yeah, he, especially with right, you go and ahead. I, huh, Chav? Yeah. Fantastic stuff. Because we could talk to, we could talk to, we could talk to Chav back at, at, at base camp in Cimarron. Yeah, mm. yeah. I was able. Our to, families. I was yeah. able to keep up with what the action that was taking place. You know, Every day. several several miles away. So, and what he's talking about. Check it out. He's talking about Jason. Is we had a satellite messenger device called Zolio, and it it pairs with your cell phone, and we were able to send messages, text messages. If the person on the other side had the Zolio app on their phone, we could send a text message of up to a thousand characters, man. And and with Luis having one and me having one, we were able to, as we hunted in two groups, we always made sure one group had it so we could communicate. So the safety factor, the ability to say where we were going and talk to each other during a hunt, um, helping with strategy, all of that stuff was huge during the hunt. So, uh, yeah. yeah, that was yeah. And then too, the, the, the other person does not need to have the app downloaded. I mean, it's easy to download us <laughs> free. But you can just receive right. it on text messages and also has the ability to uh, send quick checks with your location and SOS. It was so cool. I got to, I knocked my bull down and the first person I text was Chav, you know, cause I knew he was, he was on waiting at home and, you know, pulling for all of us. I texted him first and told him, man, it was the first thing I did, pop my phone out, you know, got the Zolio was hooked up. I text him and I text my wife. I mean, it was <clears throat> such a cool thing to have and then i got to text the guys hey man knocked one down here we go and it was in a rough place so everybody knew where we were at to come get to come help yeah that's pretty cool so any of you guys have anything you use this year that uh for the first time that you're gonna make sure you use next year the hot shower oh, oh my gosh yeah, yeah. yeah well yeah Ooh, that, that, was that like, wasn't hunting dude. gear that was camp, <laughs> right. that was that's... camp convenience man joe, yeah, that's joe, right. i know you like something and I'm going to lead you right into it, buddy. Go right ahead, man. Tell us so, what you think. So on that. I'm actually wearing it now. I was never a vest guy. And I, I started wearing a vest while I was hunting. And I found it was just awesome because... Um, You're welcome. <laughs> yeah yeah gilbert gilbert wears a vest uh, i it, 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 it's All not one time. like this man <laughs> no it's much bigger omar the tent maker made it but you Young know the thing slim size the thing i liked about it is is my arms aren't always a deal it's just my chest if i have a little coolness in the morning mm -hmm. and it's an easy unzip plus it has these 
big chest pockets that were perfect for my calls, for the cell phone, you know, where I had quick, easy access on there. And, and for me, when I'm hunting, I like quick, easy access to stuff. I don't want to be searching for things. I have some place where I do my pat checks and I know that I'm there and I really like the vest. So that's been huge now throughout my guiding season, everything. And I think the other thing, um, there were two things that I used this year that are going to keep going with me is I used, um, a first light Merino, um, layer. It's a thin Merino Mm -hmm. that I used and I use it in September hunts hot. I use it in, um, winter hunts cold. That layer is amazing. It's cool in the summer. It's warm in the winter and it really doesn't get odored up fast. And, I found that that was a huge plus. And the last thing was I went to Phelps calls, Phelps calls this, this year. And man, I just, uh, I just loved them. And I, I liked, uh, their selection. Uh, I liked how their tone, I liked their longevity. Um, I liked so much about them that, that those are three things that Zolio, um, well, actually, for my vest, the Merino from First Light and Phelps calls that um, it'll be with me again next year. And for me, the coup de gras was a fire at camp. <laughs> First time for everything, Joe. And, and Manano would uh, second that for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, uh, it was all good, man. We got to warm our bones up that last night and do our podcast. Had Chab up there. He wished there was a, a bigger fire. I'm sure. <laughs> Like <laughs> froze to death, didn't you, Jeff? <laughs> more, more of camp comfort. It's the buddy heater. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the buddy heater. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, and, okay. And a hose so, that works in it. Yeah, as yeah. you can tell, yeah. Jason, everything's about being comfortable at camp these days. But <laughs> the older oh, yeah. you get, the more it imposes its will on us. Yeah. Jason, please understand, I come from ten degrees above the equator, brother. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's hot. All right, Joe, we want you to close this out, man. Guys, it's been awesome. Again, you know, fellas, if you like what we're doing, uh, y'all please subscribe, rate, and review us. You got to go to Apple Podcasts or iTunes to review us, and you can check out more elk hunting content at elkbros.com. And just a reminder to all our listeners, if you like – Oh, if you'd like to put your question out on our, our podcast and have it answered on the show, just send your question to info at elkbros.com. That's info at elkbros.com. Uh, another unbelievable show, Joe. Lots of content for our brothers that are going to be hunting elk here towards the, the end of the season. And yep. The late season elk hunting, I think these guys are going to start whacking them and stacking them and putting them in, putting them in the picture books. Guys, keep sending us your photos, man. We love it on Instagram. Uh, you know, keep keep sending that stuff out. Keep looking at our YouTube page for more content. Luis been loading some things up, uh, and and we're going to start, you know, deer hunting here in the next few few weeks, and so we'll have some more of that stuff loaded up on on our on our uh our youtube page of some hunts with our kids and stuff like that so uh joe chav uh looking forward to seeing you guys hopefully we can get together before the years the years yep. out um but as we say down here in texas husbands kiss your wives wives kiss your husbands hug your babies keep your broad head sharp and your powder dry and we'll see you next week right here on blue collar elk Hunting. See, and I don't kiss you your broadheads. <laughs> don't kiss your broadheads. Make sure you don't do that at home. Okay? <laughs> hey guys, peace, peace, peace. peace. <laughs>